Hello, good morning to everyone. Dear colleagues, my name is Gabriela Pashova, and I would like to welcome you at the ECPR Roundtable, Educating for a Change. This roundtable features four presentations of teaching designs that support learning of international students and encourage change in thinking or practice. We have selected these designs during our collaborative international Erasmus Plus project entitled Impact. The fifth presentation summarizes the outcomes from our European survey into internationalization. You will be able to read uh, the presentations as papers in the European Political Science Journal and at our newly created open access portal on internationalization. We would really like to interact with you during this roundtable. Therefore, we have prepared for you a Kahoot game I will now share my screen with you. And I would like to invite you to take your smartphone, enter simply kahoot.it and then game pin. Uh, then you will be prompted to enter your name. Please enter your first name and the initial. Each presentation uh, will take about 10 minutes and uh, you will be asked one question. For some questions, uh, you will be asked to share your opinion. For other questions, uh, you can earn points. And at the end, you can earn a small reward. At the end of the fifth presentation, we have reser reserved 15 minutes for discussion. You will then be invited to raise your hand and comment. All right, are you ready to start? Go ahead. So this is our roundtable, Educating for a Change. And Neil Stamara, Yurai Marketa and Sylvie look forward to talking to you. We would like to start with the first question, who you are? So please uh, answer if you are an international teacher or academic, international student, international other, or if you are home teacher, academic student or other. You can choose multiple options in case uh, you are not a single identity with us. Very good. So we have 12 international teachers here, four international students, one international other, and seven are a home person. So I think this uh, roundtable can be pretty relevant to you. Now I would like to invite Niels, our first presenter, to share his teaching design with you. Yes, good morning. Thanks, Gabriela. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about a course um, that we're teaching at Lund University on um, um, global environmental governance. And I'm going to talk about how we can um, use didactical designs on, on bridging differences in, in ter terms of like national backgrounds and also different types of epistemologies in the classroom. Um, yes. and. Uh, the course is part of the Klimbeko Graduate School, uh, which is for uh, biodiversity, climate change and ecosystem services, but it's hosted by the political science department. Next slide, please. So um, I'm speaking on behalf of a uh, group of people who has been involved in the course design over the years. Uh, it's been running since 2015, and we're now going into the uh, I think ninth round. So and I've been involved since three years now. Um, yes, next slide, please. As I said, it is an interdisciplinary. Um, so the Klimbeko Graduate School, right? That's an interdisciplinary graduate school with uh, multiple disciplines involved from ecology to climate sciences uh, to social sciences and political science. And one of the questions of challenges that we face 
is how we can deal with this heterogeneous audience, how we can build bridges to facilitate understanding and exchange in a meaningful way. And that's why I'll um, evolve this talk around. So next slide, please. Um, and these are just, you know, some of the aspects that we need to bridge because we have different types of individuals with their own cultural backgrounds. Um, we have different disciplines involved. Um, so sometimes terms differ across uh, um, the scientific disciplines that students bring with them, right? But that also brings, you know, they, all ha they hold different types of knowledge which is a treasure, so to say, but we need to find ways how, how we can make use of that in order to, to, to let them learn also from one another. So it also involves different types of epistemologies, different ways how we look at the world and how we think we can learn stuff about it. Yes, um, next slide, please. So it is a mixed method didactic um, design that we have. We, we have classical lectures where we kind of make sure that everybody knows uh, the basic concepts involved uh, in international environmental governance. And we also have more interactive seminars where students present their own research, right? That's one of these forums where students um, can learn from one another, but um, we also have fairly applied um, workshops. And those are, I think, the most interactive elements in, in our course. And I'm mainly gonna talk about an example of, an, of a workshop that we've been running um, for the first time last year. And so we kind of mix different didactical approaches here from transmissive to active learning, and then also the more experiential um, learning approaches where students really get engaged. Yes, next slide, please. So um, what we've been trying is um, a game that's based on Bruno Latour's book, Politics of Nature, um, that is about how we can hear the voices of all those involved in a decision-making process, right? And especially when it comes to, say, land use governance and environmental governance. So um, the idea is that it's not just humans, but also non-humans that are involved in this, you know, the space um, that the, there's going to be multiple entities, so to say, that are going to be affected and have, that have stakes um, in, in the decision. And so we want to hear them all. We want to have, we want to hear the voices of those involved. And, and then the idea is to kind of renegotiate a first uh, come up with how a good common world could look like and then negotiate how we could get there. Uh, and it's motivated by the current inability or inadequacy of the current political system to face these uh, planetary challenges in environmental governance. Um, next slide, please. So it's a game, right? It's a, it's a gamified uh, simulation, which kind of already helps, you know, to step a bit beyond oneself, um, because yeah, it's a, it's a game between the students, right? So there is going to be rounds, um, and with different stages. And the end goal is to say to have a negotiated solution or pathway to to how we could get to a kind of an ideal system right where where the voices where the interests of everybody would be recognized and um, as far as possible also satisfied and the game then kind of starts with identifying who should be there on um, an imagined table who should be sitting on the table making a decision on a say ecosystem let's suppose a forest ecosystem or something else, right? So identification is the first stage and that's collaboratively done. 
And then um, the second stage continues with mapping out the relations between all these entities beings. And um, I'll show you an example in a sec, um, what kind of entities these could be. Um, but we kind of map out the relational map, right? And then um, ideation, that's where the creative thinking starts, um, how we could picture an ideal um, system. And the resolution stage, that's when the negotiation starts between all these entities, right? But they are not all sitting on the table. You need to keep that in mind. Um, and then the kind of, it's how we can negotiate between the ones sitting on the table and the ones who should be sitting on the table as well. And then if, if there, no resolution is reached, then the cycle continues, right? Maybe we've been missing some important beings or relations, or we haven't come up with a good idea yet how, how the uh, system could look like. And this continues until we kind of reach a bit of a say consensus depends a bit we can be flexible with the criteria when a um, implementation phase would be reached right and that's then the end of the game next slide please so if we focus on on this kind of network here in the center first um that's just a random example of um beings that would be, for example, relevant for a forest ecosystem, right? We need to think of the birds and the wolves and the trees and, the, of course, the humans, say, forests and other types of land uses, the hikers, right? But there's also rivers because water is important also to us and people living in the city. Um, that's just to give you an impression how this could look like, right? At the first stage, we would have met all these individuals as so our beings. And, and then we would have met their relation and we would have qualified that as well, how they are related. And then what I think um, helps building bridges is that the students um, are being challenged intellectually because they do not just need to come up with this kind of, of, of map and then envision how the system could look like, but they also need to take up roles, right? The first role is we need to make sure that uh, every being in the system is represented by someone. So every uh, player becomes an ambassador for one or multiple beings. And then on top of that, so that's the intellectual challenge, they also have roles in the game. Um, there's a scientist who uh, makes sure that we base our decisions on objective kind of knowledge. Right? There's the politician who tries to make, make sure that um, the negotiations uh, go correctly, that we come up with a feasible implementation. And there's the artist who's in charge of coming up with creative ideas. Uh, the moralist makes sure that we stick to our moral values and then we reflect upon them, our moral values. There's the administrator who looks at procedures um, and, and, and the diplomat who is trying to you know, appease the negotiations. Um, Two more minutes, Nails. Yes. So, and I think on the next slide, we, we have a question for you. Um, why you think uh, such a thing could be good for teaching international students? And multiple answers uh, are correct. All right. Thank you. So, yeah, <laughs> that's an, a fairly even distribution. Um, that's not a difficult question. <laughs> well, um, I, I think all are correct in this case, right? Um, because, yes, so thinking of what other beings would want in a particular situation, I think that helps to uh, develop empathy, right? Um, and I think that also helps building bridges between students in a gamified situation, right? Um, because we think of the system and the relations between the beings also helps our understanding of the system in question. And because it has this, you know, drive towards the implementation, it's also solution oriented. Um, so a few more comments now before I stop and um, that more slides, I think, yes. So, you know, 
can we go back one? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, you know, I, I think we are facing grand challenges um, and there's going to be some heavy lifting involved. Uh, um, and I don't think we already know how we can solve this very difficult task. So um, it, it is a challenge how we can, you know, move our, you know, the, the global environmental governance system, how we should have to change, how we need to change it. Right, to, to reach a more sustainable development. The next slide, please. So and I, I think this politics of nature game that helps us, you know, to map out uh, possible pathways for how we can transform our current system, which is not sustainable towards a more uh, sustainable state. If that's, well, it's not static, right? But uh, yeah, that's what I think about things. Thank you very much, Niels. I would like to invite now uh, Tamara uh, to share her presentation with us. Tamara, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, uh, for joining this uh, this panel. And I am going to talk a little bit about uh, my experience in teaching politics and memory with film. And I will ask. Gabriela, for the next slide, to give you a little bit of a context uh, of the course that I was teaching. So I was working at Bard College Berlin at the time. This was spring 2020. And I was asked to design a course that would fall within what they call the advanced politics curriculum. So political science courses for students who are um, second to fourth year. But it would also appeal to a large number of um, students in social sciences and humanities, all on the BA level who come from very diverse backgrounds. Um, I think Bard is, it's a very small university for those who don't know, it's a liberal arts university that focuses on solely BA students um, in Berlin. And it is very small, but extremely diverse. I think they have about, when I was there, it was about 75 different nationalities in this really small student body. And so this was kind of the, the course that I was asked to design. And I also had, as we all do, several limitations in this. And one was the very di differing interests um, among the students I could expect to enroll in the course, considering that they were from two tracks, some in social sciences, some from humanities, very different background knowledge, um, and also years of education, uh, ranging from second to fourth year, but also my own skill set. So I always say that I'm a political scientist by training and a memory scholar by choice, and I work on um, film and memory in uh, contemporary Croatia. So I'm kind of limited by what I know, at least in designing a course. And as we all do, I had practical limitations, um, very short time to design a course, um, the amount of funds that I could use to, to develop a course, um, kind of facilities that we had, do we had a room, where could we meet, all of these things that I know you're all familiar with. Um, can I get the next uh, slide, please. So I ended up with a course design um, for a course that I called Screening the 90s, Politics, Memory and Film in the Post-Yugoslav Countries. And I decided to build a course um, around my main teaching tool, which was film. Uh, and this meant that we had weekly film screenings of mostly fiction, uh, but also experimental documentaries from countries of the former Yugoslavia, but also that we used excerpts and short films during actual classes. I will, I will explain in a sec what this meant. Learning outcomes very broadly. I wanted my students to learn several things. Uh, one is to get acquainted with what had happened in the former Yugoslavia with the basic facts of the dissolution and the development afterwards, but also with different interpretations also from different disciplines on why this had happened. Uh, to understand the basic concepts in political science and memory studies that would enable them to unpack this, such as populism, nationalism, sovereignty, memory in itself, uh, what is collective memory. And um, so I wanted my students also to get really this um, understanding of being able to use politics to unpack culture and being able to understand culture in the context of politics, and finally to train um, basic academic skills, as, as we always aim for, uh, reading, writing, critical thinking, um, collaborative working, and um, peer learning to get them to learn as much from each other as possible. So my course was divided into four parts. I, I won't go into great details, but we move, moved from history, um, general explanations coming from IR, coming from political scientists, towards 
um, building narratives on what is happening towards how this becomes memory, which was the second part, general theories of collective cultural memory, then moving on to particular topics that were relevant in post-Yugoslav um, countries in these narratives, hence memory discourses, and then finally talking about change, evolution of memory, whether it happened, why not, why this matters. So this also allowed me to diversify my assignments uh, I will not talk much about this now because we don't have much time, but in essence, they had three basic assignments assigned, aside from participation. They did group presentations in the first week of the class to get this immersive experience of what it feels like to talk about an area that you're not particularly familiar with. What do you go for? How do you interpret it? They had position papers for each of the four parts of the course and one film paper. And just a bit of the course technicality so you get an idea of where I taught this. So it was a 14 week semester. I had 10 students from six different countries ranging from Eritrea to the US, two out of whom were from the former Yugoslavia. Uh, and we met three times a week. So we had um, two sessions of 90 minutes, Monday lecture, then Tuesday, uh, joint film screenings, which we opened up for the whole university. And then on Wednesday, we would have a, this broad panel discussion in which we would unpack the films and connect them to the readings. And I will ask Gabriela for the next slide to show you. Ah, a quiz to ask you actually, uh, what do you think why I decided to use film as a teaching learning tool? And uh, this is a multiple choice question and there are right and wrong questions. Uh, yes. right and wrong answers to an extent, uh, but in some of these things you will probably notice um, overlap a bit um, as well. So did I want to bring the region closer to the students? Did I want to use the films as an entry point to discuss complex materials, to teach students about the film history, or foster a culture of participation? Ha! <laughs> so, <laughs> good, good answers, but also a little bit of wrong answers. And I will take a second to explain why I use films based on this. So one of my starting points in thinking was that I really want my students to be engaged and interested in this region that many of them not, know nothing about. Some of them have been, um, others have never been. Some had this backpacker experience with uh, former Yugoslavia. And I was also quite afraid that they will have this balkanized discourse of what had happened there. Uh, for those of you who are a bit familiar with uh, Maria Todorova's work, this idea that it was something exotic, that it was something distant, and yet we were sitting uh, two hours away by flight from this. So I wanted to make them engaged in a way that would really um, allow them to think about this as they would about any other, uh, any other region that they are studying in a different course. I wanted to use films to open up sometimes very complex concepts that we were learning, especially for very young students. I will give you an example in a second. What I didn't want to do is teach my, my students um, the history uh, of film in the region. I am myself, as I said, a political scientist, not a film scholar. And while we did talk about some elements of style because they're very important uh, for understanding how films produce uh, narratives of the conflict and then later on memory narratives, we didn't focus on, on the uh, very wonderful actual film history of the region and I wanted to use films as an entry point for my students to participate. So this was a second to fourth year course of very diverse uh, student knowledge, interests, everything. I wanted them to feel comfortable um, and I thought that starting with films, um, something that we all kind of relate to and, and can work with was a good idea. So I'll give you an example on the next slide how this actually worked. Um, but before that, very important, score points. Uh, always a bit of uh, competition, it's not that bad. But how did this work in practice? Just very briefly. So one of the first concepts that we discussed in the theoretical section of, of the course in the beginning was nationalism. And I wanted my students to understand nationalism. So we had a lecture on Monday about different theories of nationalism. We ended up with Rogers Brubaker's idea of not what a nation is, but how do we use a nation? But this all can be very abstract, especially for very young BA students who haven't fit, faced this before. So what we did on Wednesday was that we watched Excerpt, excerpts from two films um, from former Yugoslavia, one from Serbia and one from Croatia, um, Vukovar's story and time for, for my students to see how through these films, different discourses of who we are, 
who they are developed, how, how the war started in the interpretations of these films, for them to get a more practical idea of what nationalism felt and how nationalism manifested in these contexts. And also to think about not just of these films as kind of representations, but of co-constructors. So these are films that were made in the early 90s. So we also had a chance to discuss this a little bit. And I think I have two more slides. Can I get the next one to just tell you how I think this mm -hmm. all related to the topic? Two more minutes, Pamela. Two more minutes, perfect. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to use films to inspire change through knowledge, but what does it mean to inspire change? And I think for me, political scientists are very lucky because we teach students how very broadly the world works, how institutions work. And for me to inspire change is to get my students to understand the institutions and the setting within which they live. And so I tried to use films to help me with these three things, to teach for understanding. As I mentioned before, I wanted my students to get a deeper understanding and engagement uh, with the region, and also to get a better understanding of how these concepts are, are tangible for them and how they are applicable for elsewhere, for their own context, for different countries they're interested in. And films were a very nice gateway into this. They were also very good for me for assessments. Of course, we all want to assess for understanding. We want to know how much our students have actually learned, understood. But because I was working with such a broad group of students, I could assess on the one hand through the position papers and presentations, the skills from the more conventionally social science trained students, but the film papers, which they also had to write, allowed me to also give the opportunity to my uh, humanities students to show what is the best uh, in, in their skill set, which was quite different very often. And I wanted to empower my students to understand, to feel comfortable, to feel invited to participate. And I think films were not necessarily all media literate, but we think that we are, and we try to uh, engage with media all the time on a daily basis. And I thought it would be very good to open the course up through this and to empower the students. And I didn't have time to show you some of the quotes, but I actually think my, my students kind of felt this. And just one last word on the other uh, topic of this panel, which is internationalization. So we all have very different understandings and there are debates about what this means, but I think at least in two ways, films helped me to internationalize my course. One was to not just engage with the academic literature, which is mostly Western based on these topics um, of Yugoslav breakup and the aftermath, but also through films to introduce very much domestic um, representations because the most of the films that we watched were from former Yugoslavia. We watched one Romanian and we had a couple of French short films as well, but most of them were from former Yugoslavia. And the other thing, going back to empowering my students and getting them to learn from each other, they were a very internationalized student body. And I wanted them to get the sense of the region, but also to give their knowledge to their colleagues through the course, being invited through uh, these films and it worked very nicely. I very often got, hey, I recognize this from a film from my region. I recognize this from a book from my region. So I thought that worked quite well. And I will stop there. I will ask Gabriela for the last slide just to say thank you and uh, to insert a bit of humor for those of you who know this film. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tamara. I just repeat that please do keep and do reserve your questions and remarks after the last presentation. Now I would like to invite Yurai to share his design. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Uh, thanks everyone for coming to this talk. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, my recent personal experience with teaching a course in the methodology of science to a very diverse audience, which was a, a new thing for me. And it uh, uh, reminded me uh, or, or pointed out to me certain, certain problems in my own teaching. Next slide, please. So uh, what basically happened was I began teaching an undergraduate course uh, to an international audience, uh, and that pointed out some problems with the course design. And to tackle these problems, I tried to propose a new design that I will implement in the forthcoming academic year, when I also plan to study the impact uh, of this innovation using a simple research design um, in the same academic year. So in my talk, I will first tell you a bit about the course, what it is and um, who usually uh, is the audience. Um, I will then tell you a bit about the challenges. Um, I will try to sum it up uh, in, a, in, a, in a brief way and then discuss the innovation in a bit more detail and focus especially 
on the role of group work that um, that group work will uh, is supposed to play in the in the uh, reimagined version of the course. Um, next slide, please. So, methodology of science is the name of a, of an elective course for five credits that is offered to undergraduate freshmen in the Central European Studies program, which is an international program here at the uh, Faculty of Arts at Comenius University in Bratislava. It is the only international or fully international program at the faculty, so it is taught entirely in English. Um, it has a, a varied audience um, in the sense that there are students with a local background coming from Slovakia, but uh, with a large uh, portion of uh, students from the local Hungarian minority. And there are also international students, mostly from uh, other non-EU Eastern European countries. Uh, and since the, uh, the offer of uh, courses in English at our faculty is rather limited, uh, the course is also often picked by visiting Erasmus students. So all in all, I typically have a group of 10 to 20 students. And the goal of the course is to um, enable the students um, to, to, to form an understanding of some fundamental methodological concepts, such as hypothesis, theory, uh, measurement, etc., that they can use to, to think about their own research, but also to understand research that they, that they read about uh, while studying for, for other courses. Um, but perhaps more importantly, uh, a key objective of the course is uh, to develop students' skills that they need for composing a research proposal, by which I mean a, a brief document of two or three pages that describes uh, uh, a research project that the students themselves could undertake. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I began teaching this to uh, an international audience uh, in 2018. I have previous experience with teaching methodology of science. I'm a philosopher of science by training, but this was the first time I, I taught in English and um, to a diverse audience. And uh, from the get-go, I, I became worried by, by uh, a challenge that, is, that has been twofold. Um, first of all, the, the participation rates or the involvement of students uh, in class was less than ideal. Um, only about 25% of students were showing genuine interest and doing more than the, than the, than the bare minimum. And the quality of the work um, by students was often less than, less than ideal, less than optimal. Uh, this is closely connected to another challenge or to, to the second aspect of the challenge. Um, that my students in this group usually have very different educational backgrounds in terms of their fields, because I always have these uh, visiting students who come through Erasmus. Um, their levels of English are different. Um, and so this, all, all of this results in, in very different learning needs and learning outcomes and ultimately grades. Um, generally, uh, it has been the case that uh, my international students have been more motivated and also better prepared for the course uh, than local students. And this may be a good time to uh, ask the question on, on Kahoot. Uh, I would be interested in, in, telling you, uh, in, in you telling me um, whether you have found uh, international students more engaged in your classes than local students, or if it was the same for you. And this question does not have any right or wrong answers. It's yeah, all... exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So no worries that you enter something wrong. Oh, okay. So some of you have had the same experience as myself. Uh, I mean, my experience in, in this regard is rather limited, but I, but I did find um, international students to generally be more advanced in terms of their language skills, but also in, uh, more motivated and more involved in, in, in the course. Okay, can we switch to the next slide? So, like I said, in my case, the, uh, the international students acted as the uh, proverbial canary in the coal mine that uh, pointed out certain issues with the, uh, with the teaching environment that I was uh, creating for students. Um, and so the flaws that, that uh, I noticed in, in my course design were basically the, uh, the, the heavy emphasis on lectures uh, and on summative assessment. Um, the basic mechanic of the course was that students would have to repeat what they have learned throughout the semester on the final exam, which accounted for 50% of the grade. 
Um, the research proposal, which was, uh, like I said, supposed to have been uh, a key learning objective, um, was only one of a number of uh, written assignments and it only accounted for 8% of the final grade. And uh, as a general problem, uh, there was little reason for students to interact with each other. Um, so most of the interactions in class uh, were based around the figure of the teacher. Um, and I wanted to change that so that students can, can really use this um, diverse intercultural environment. And so with the help of uh, my colleagues from the IMPACT project, I came up with a new design. Um, next slide, please. Um, that unlike the previous design uh, is more, more of a backward design in the sense that it starts with learning objectives and then moves on uh, to align everything else all of the other aspects of the course with these objectives. So with this in mind, um, the research proposal will become a central activity that will cover the entire semester basically, and it will account for 50% of the grade as it should. Um, the final exam is uh, done away with and it is replaced by a much briefer uh, midterm quiz that only focuses on the most difficult part of the course uh, in terms of theoretical knowledge that we cover in the first five or six weeks. Um, and like I said, to, to use the uh, diversity of my audience to enhance learning, I want to introduce group work. So the research proposal will, will remain um, an individual project on which students are graded individually. But I also want to introduce some elements of group work. So students will work on their proposals in groups of four to five. Uh, and these groups will be specifically tailored to mix different skill levels and different cultural backgrounds. Um, the next slide shows how, how this is supposed to work. So at the beginning of the semester, um, students will take an ungraded um, introductory quiz, um, which will enable me to estimate uh, what their level of English is, whether they have previously been exposed to some methodology, um, what their overall general knowledge is, etc. And based on this, they will be uh, uh, divided into groups of four to five students. Uh, which should serve as a sort of supporting environment throughout the semester in which students uh, will be able to brainstorm on their research proposals, um, compare notes, uh, give each other feedback. And then at the end of the semester, they will also uh, provide more formal uh, peer feedback to each other uh, in the form of uh, uh, basically feedback forms that uh, each student will have to fill out a feedback form for at least one uh, research proposal done by some, someone else. Um, and finally, uh, at, the, at the very end of the semester, we will organize colloquia uh, of these groups uh, in which students will, will um, present or, or defend, if you like, uh, their research proposals and also address uh, any potential comments and feedback that they will receive from their peers. Um, next slide, please. Um, Two more minutes, Yurai. Okay. Um, well, I, I will only briefly mention that I was able to trial some of these aspects uh, of this, uh, some of the aspects of this innovation in the previous semester. So we did a little, a little bit of group work. We changed the assignment, uh, the uh, assessment, um, a little bit, and um, as usual, there were some issues. So uh, I have something to think about before the semester starts. Um, so one thing I noticed was that there was uh, not enough spontaneous activity um, in the groups. Uh, uh, so students who are more advanced didn't go looking for help that they don't need. And the uh, less advanced students perhaps were a, a little bit too shy. It didn't, it didn't help that uh, all of the teaching was online. So these groups didn't really meet in person. They could only meet on, on Teams. So I'm thinking about maybe introducing some, some group assignments uh, or some incentives for, for actually cooperating in the groups. Um, another problem was that the peer feedback that students would provide to each other was sometimes too forgiving. So students didn't want to uh, be too critical of their peers. Uh, maybe this could be mitigated a little bit by, by making the whole review process blind um, as, in, as in journals. Um, and I've also encountered the perennial problem of, of all student surveys, uh, that, the, that the response rate for my survey, when I was trying to find out how satisfied students are with the course and uh, what, what they think about group work, et cetera, um, the response rate was only about 30, uh, 30%. Um, so as you can see, there are still some things to think about. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, thank you for, for coming to my talk and, and listening to my uh, report from the field. Uh, the results of, the, of my study of the impact of this innovation will be the subject of a, of a future paper. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you, Yurai. And now I would like to invite Marketa to present her uh, teaching design. Thank you for this opportunity to reflect my teaching experience here at this inspiring roundtable. I teach at Faculty of Education, Masaryk University in Brno, which is the second largest city in the Czech Republic. Next, please. Uh, today, I would love to share my experience with internationalization of my course. Is, is it not a complete process at all? but it's more about mind shift and institutional change. I will share a bit of a theoretical framework, then I will describe the identified discourses which helped me to change the methods or methodology in my classes. Then I will describe the COIL project that is incorporated into my courses, and I will finish with the global competences I'm trying to build in my courses. Next, please. It is hard to teach students to gain the knowledge and skills of global citizenship in class where everyone speaks the same language and everyone has the same cultural background. So unlike the previous speakers, my courses were for local Czech students, uh, usually taught in the Czech language. I believe that especially faculty of education must reflect on trends in education and respond to the changing and accelerating and connecting world. In recent years, the world has accelerated to such an extent and opened up so many possibilities that it is no longer possible to be educated towards one profession that one will make for the rest of his or her life. So I uh, felt this change to incorporate into my class. I felt that my students need opportunity to work with people who are different from them. So the first course, as you can see, practice teaching assistant, I designed it to actually uh, for students have the opportunity to work with the local community. Students are asked to tutor a child from social disadvantaged background. It might be migrants family or in the Czech Republic, there is a, a Roma community. So they have the opportunity to work with the local communities. Next, please. I was inspired by Bauman's concept of solid and liquid modernity. Concept of solid modernity is based on a social world that is habituated, ordered, and characterized by its resistance to change. Liquid modernity is when the simple presence of the structure be wherever of is no more a guarantee of its functionality. The uncertainty becomes the only certainty. And as Rosa stated, it is a progress and new technologies that have begun to accelerate the pace of society. And within the ubiquity of the internet, boundaries between online and offline are blurring. Florida states that most of the time we live on life. The online world understands technologies as an autonomous unit that no longer serves only as a tool for people, but has the ability to learn, communicate, and influence human behavior and feelings. We can see this clearly here on this conference. Next, please. With students, I decided to focus on their identity because it's source for their future teaching. So we are starting with the activity about their identity. We also discuss uh, where the knowledge is being produced that is connected with the decolonial approach. And the teaching content is influenced not only by the language, but also by culture and ideology. So that needs to be considered to avoid reinforced culture hegemony. And the internet became a significant catalyst for acceleration. The 21st century is described as the era of algorithm. So we also need to talk about the changes in the social structures that through technology and information uh, distribution globally. Uh, also the discourse of uh, in critical internationalization 
uh, brings me to the shift to change the home curriculum because the possibility of mobility and international experience is uh, still limited. It's still not for all students. So the internationalization of home curriculum can help that students who are not able to spend one semester abroad. And today in polarized society discourse of also of epistemological populism needs to be addressed. Next, please. So I decided to incorporate COIL project into my courses. Uh, collaborative online international learning uh, is a form of a global learning for both teachers and their students. With COIL, teachers from a different institution, countries, culture, design a course to challenge their students with a diverse knowledge and perspective. It could be fully online, hybrid, or face-to-face -face courses. COIL projects can take place in real time so that students from different countries are communicating and interacting live simultaneously. However, project can also take place asynchronously, which means students from each country can interact and work together at different times. This may be helpful when time difference between countries are not manageable. You can create course in the same discipline or in contemporary disciplines. And in the beginning, we are having meeting with icebreaker activities to help students get to know each other better. Then we have a collaborative task, small project in teams where students are uh, dealing with some social issue and trying to come up with some solution from their perspective. And the important part uh, are reflection activities uh, during the whole course. Next, please. Uh, Coil brings benefits, benefits for all participants. Uh, one of the key action is one of the key action that may help students become global graduates. Most notably, it will provide them opportunity to, to interact, engage, and collaborate with peers. They would have not otherwise have the chance to work with them. Uh, they can share understanding of one another, another society, uh, ways of living, culture. They can observe, listen, learn about differences in communication style. Uh, they can uh, experience, interact, and gain insights into the cultural differences. And it certainly develop digital skills that they are key to uh, for the 21st century. It also has some challenges. Uh, it's teaching with technologies, so there are all the time little glitches. But as we are experiencing in the COVID time, but uh, I would say the main uh, challenge for teachers are the maybe the designing a new international course for scratch. It it's it could take a lot of uh, time and effort, but it's definitely worth it from my experience. Next, please. Uh, students also say that this kind of course help them to be more self-confident. Uh, maybe they are too, not willing to take classes which are fully in English, but when this is just part of the class, they can learn that they are actually able to make it, they can create a friendship and then share, they share that uh, it inspired them or motivate them to actually try study abroad because they have the experience with teaching in a different language. Next, please. More minutes, Marketa. Yeah. And uh, we have, uh, I would like to share the global competencies uh, we are focusing on. Global competence can help young people develop cultural awareness and respectful interaction in increasing diverse society. And it could recognize a challenge, culture biases and stereotypes and facilitate uh, 
harmonious living in multicultural communities. It's prepared for the world of work, which increasingly demands individuals who are effective communicators and open to uh, differences to diversity. And I think that next slide, we have a question, right? Perfect. So you can decide what are the chief benefits of using COIL in courses for students and it's multiple choice. Multiple answers. Sorry. <laughs> So it's basically a wrap-up question. What do you think? What are the chief benefits of using COIL in higher education courses? Yeah, it's, it seems that you are a good listener. Mm -hmm. There is definitely a lot of uh, benefits. Uh, there is definitely a lot of challenges and it uh, needs to be discussed and be prepare for that but I would say it helps to internationalize the program the content and it really helps me as a teacher to change the uh, mindset and maybe the uh, methods I am using in my ordinary class so thank you for for listening I would say uh, this new way of uh, uh, virtual exchange is uh, really helping to connect uh, each other, connect the sources, connect different institutions and connect different teaching styles and discuss the social issue from broader perspective than the national wise. Thank you. So thank you very much. And I would like to invite now Silvio, our last presenter. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Silvio Pilos. I uh, convened the Standing Group on Teaching and Learning Politics, among other things. And as part of that, I've had the pleasure um, to contribute to the implementation of the IMPACT project um, that you've perhaps already heard about it. Some of, of my co-panelists, uh, of course, are part of it as well. As part of the IMPACT project, we are currently working on a study um, that really looks at the practices that enhance learning for international students. We've seen uh, some, some reports for, from uh, uh, my colleagues, um, and now we're going to zoom out a bit um, and try to see exactly um, what the response or survey um, thoughts that, uh, you know, kind of practices enhance learning for international students. Next slide, please. Fantastic, thank you. So um, as I mentioned, we, we've designed this um, study to have two parts. I'm going to focus on the first part today, part A, which is uh, a survey that we ran uh, between uh, May and September uh, 2020. Um, we've collected 94 uh, answers and I'm going to run you through them. Uh, we'll try to see exactly what they mean um, and yeah, give us some food for thought of how can we improve uh, you know, the, the various uh, aspects that contribute to, to better learning experience for international students. Next slide, please. So when we designed the, the part A of, of the study, the survey, we had a, a threefold focus. So we, we thought that it's very important uh, that we look a bit how institutions are set up and what kind of um, uh, support they offer to international uh, students or international staff for that matter. Uh, then we look at the, the student body, so what kind of students, how diverse they are, where they come from, uh, and how does that have an impact on the learning experience. And of course, we also look at the method. Uh, you know, and this is also what, what has happened in the first part of this uh, roundtable. We discussed a bit methods, so we asked um, our respondents um, um, as well to tell us about the kind of methods that they use to teach to international um, students. Why we think this? But we think that you know best practices do, don't just appear; they don't just happen in, in a vacuum. Uh, so we wanted to get a bit of a holistic view, and we thought that these uh, three key factors uh, always reinforce uh, and um, influence um, each other. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I'm going to walk you uh, through the results uh, now. So just to to kind of put this geographically. Uh, this uh, the first part of the study uh, actually reached beyond Europe, 
uh, actually have a very, very nice global coverage, uh, a total of 33 countries out of which 19 uh, are from the EU and 14 non-EU. But if you look at the total amount of answers, then it's, it's a majority of, of EU countries are respondents. I think on the next slide, uh, you actually have a, yeah, a map of the world just to give you an idea where we collected um, our answers from. Next slide, please. All right, so what are kind of the results uh, that we got? So if we've, again, going back to the three, uh, yeah, three pillars that I've, I've mentioned before, we look at, at, at the teacher and the student, kind of the you know, student body and kind of uh, teaching stuff. Uh, we find at these universities, uh, we're lucky enough to, to get responses from um, uh, uh, universities that have at least a third or more of, of uh, their students uh, that are international students. Then we looked a bit also at the teaching loads. Uh, we thought that's also very important, but here we didn't get a very clear answer. It very much varies between one and four courses. I think this is pretty much the rule at most universities, uh, at least in Europe. The, the, the nature of the courses that were taught by our, our participants uh, was largely political science, IR, European study, politics, sociology, and law. This perhaps has to do with the fact that we use uh, the TLP standing group to, to uh, disseminate uh, the survey, uh, but this is basically our crowds. Uh, then we looked a bit at the class size, it's always very important and very uh, yeah, relevant to see uh, you know, how many students they teach to, because this, of course, influences the kind of um, um, yeah, work and, and the kind of innovations that can reach to. And here, small and medium class sizes, by that we mean between 10, 10 and 30 or 30 and 50 uh, students was, was predominant. And then of course we asked about teaching support. It's always a very contentious question I had to ask. Um, and then we actually asked them to um, elaborate what kind of support they get, so whether it's teaching assistants, PhD students, um, instructional designers, so, so learning design supports. Uh, and this, even if you combine it it, it, it holds true for about half of the respondents. Uh, which means the other half get not uh, any kind uh, of support. And I think it's also kind of relevant uh, for the results. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, so then we looked at the institutions. Um, yeah, because we thought uh, the way the institutions are set uh, and, and have the instruments to support uh, internationalization is also quite relevant. Uh, we asked whether they give uh, importance to teaching or research. And uh, yeah, I, most of our respondents uh, come from institutions that rather give equal teaching. This holds true for uh, almost 60% of, of the answers. Then of course we asked, do they have an internationalization strategy? Because yeah, yeah the university needs to have some sort of policy uh, that, that it guides this process. And here as well, 63% uh, of the respondents um, say they do have one. Um, now, it, it differs very much if you look into the answers, whether this is something that the university came up with, whether this is a national a strategy that they have adopted. Um, so uh, this, this really differs. But if you look at what were the aims of the strategy, um, are then you will see that's largely to facilitate mobilities um, and uh, the setup of a project or grant consortia. So these were the two key uh, aspects that they've uh, identified. Uh, of course, we asked whether they have a teaching and learning strategy, and, and this is a different kind of answers that we got here. Uh, it's half of, of the one before, if you look at it, so 37%, just not that much. And if you look even beyond that, then you'll see it largely focuses on student satisfaction and employability. And of course, if you ask whether there's financial incentives and then things go even more south, there is some, most of them could identify some of it, uh, whether faculty, university or national level, but for 36%, there's actually no financial uh, incentive for international teaching uh, development at their institution. Next slide, please. And then uh, if we looked a bit into the method, which was the, th the third uh, component uh, of, of our study. Uh, we asked uh, how you know, the teaching process carries on with international students. Uh, do they give individual feedback? Yes, surprisingly, almost three out of four do that. 
Uh, do they consider active learning and an active learning methods? Um, and here was also, uh, we gave multiple options, but there, the majority of the answers were yes, uh, especially collaborative uh, activities, problem-based learning was mentioned, blended and online learning, of course, this was uh, second semester of 2020, so everybody was already online, so online was given a particular attention, uh, perhaps linked to that as well. Uh, are there mobility offices uh, at their institutions? Yes, so any kind of body that supports uh, uh, international students with their particular needs. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's, that's very positive. Uh, but when you go and again, go deeper and ask for, for support on training on inclusivity, bias, awareness raising, uh, then, then it's really, really not uh, much going on. Next slide, please. Mindful of the time, uh, I think this is time for the poll now. Um, and yeah, we're actually asking you one of the questions that we ask in the survey. What do you consider to be the biggest obstacles for improving internationalization at your university? Ah, it can be one, it can be many, of course, there's no wrong um, answer. But um, I think it's very important also that we see from, from the group of att attendees uh, today. Um, what do you think? Uh, what's the biggest hurdle at your institution? And then, Silvio, it's two more minutes. And then it's two more minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So like a financial incentive, this is pretty much in line with, with uh, the answers that we got in, in our survey. Uh, on one hand, then the second one would be well, governance uh, structure, regulation, or lack of. Um, which again holds true with, with, with most of the experience of, of our participants. And then of course, uh, teaching development, uh, teaching staff support. Thank you. We can move next. And yeah, um, I have a couple of, I think we'll just go fast through, through these ones, also mindful of the time. Um, a couple of uh, answers that we, so we also ask for open answers. Um, and if you read through them, you'll see that, you know, English language is a problem for many institutions that don't uh, really have uh, su sufficient courses available or any kind of English language training. Uh, next one, and I've packed three or four. Uh, yeah, recruitment strategy, of course, uh, fees, price, uh, institutional den denial of uh, addressing cult academic culture, racism, some was mentioned. Next one. Uh, yeah, it, it's also a bit uh, uh, looking at, at the, the student body and not really uh, yeah, making the most of, of the um, yeah, potential. So something a strategy could address. Uh, and then, yeah, incentives. Uh, you know, somebody said very, very rightfully, good teaching doesn't count towards tenure or advancement in academic career. This is true. I think if you go um, most of, of the European uh, universities and beyond, uh, so that's a big, big Hurdle. All right, uh, next one. Now it's time to kind of, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and I have one more here that looks at administrative managers. Uh, you know, so basically not giving importance to, to internationalization. This feeds into the strategy or lack of points. Um, and so let's, yeah, let's take something away from this. There's a lot of data and I think it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and we're certainly going to make a, a study out of it. But I, I wanted to present it already. This is the first time we're presenting it actually, um, because I think it, it highlights a couple of very, very uh, interesting uh, points. Uh, and and in, in, a, in a way it's really, um, yeah, some of our hypotheses uh, seem to, to, to be true. Um, so yeah, strategy is important, but it's not sufficient. It's something that the institutions should have, but if you don't give enough uh, teaching support, training, development, and of course the, the international teaching experience won't be uh, very, very positive. Then of course, very often the, the neglected issues of student well-being, inclusiveness, diversity of equity, you have to think that you're getting a very, very diverse body, more diverse than, than you had. So you, know, you have to think how to include this. And finally, I think this was something that we're still coping with and, and probably in next years we'll see what the actually long-term effects of COVID-19 crisis are on internationalization. We talk a lot about internationalization uh, nowadays, but it's not taking place in the way that it used to, you know, uh, years ago. So this has some repercussions on also the mobilities, but also 
the nature of, of, of uh, teaching and the learning uh, experience as such. So this is a bit of food for thought um, about, you know, if you want the bigger picture of um, internationalization and teaching to international um, crowds. And I'll stop here. Um, and yeah, I look forward to, to see what you think uh, about this and maybe have a discussion at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silvio. And before we open the floor for discussion, I would like to announce the three winners. So it's Caroline on the third place, Barbara and Leslie. So Leslie, please do not forget to get back to me, preferably by email, gabriela.pleshova uniba.sk, and I will send you your reward. I will now stop sharing my screen and I would like to open the floor for discussion. I could see that we already had uh, two questions. So please, if you can unmute your microphone and post the question or say comment. Yes, um, so I was thinking, given all the institutions out there and they're like this or functionality, um, what what do you think we could do, you know, as teachers to, to enhance international student experience? I mean, like, to brainstorm a bit from, like, lessons learned from all the talks. We would like to hear opinion from our audience uh, because we are always afraid that we are sitting alone uh, behind our computers. So, I think Alistair. Alistair had a question in chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm unmuted as well. I've just written it as well to the panelists. Um, I'd like <clears> to thank everyone for what they've said. Really fascinating, all of you. Uh, but I've got a, a, a question for you to consider. Um, you're all talking about overseas students coming to your university. Is there any consideration given to going to other universities and speaking there? Because that's something that I do on a regular basis and it is still considered part of our internationalization of education. So just, you know, have you considered about interactions with other universities where staff go there? So I, I know of, of two programs that would support that in my case. Um, there is a, a national uh, foundation teaching sabbatical program where I could go to another university and, and teach there for half a year. And there is Erasmus Plus um, programs for uh, teaching staff as well uh, to facilitate mobility. All right, so, uh, so Bill's comment was, uh, the thought about internationalization changing post-COVID. It will be interesting to see how this develops. The digital uh, world could open up internationalization, but in totally different ways than previously. Yeah, that's true. That's um, that's probably actually what's, what's happening already. Um, we had a very interesting discussion about this in the panel yesterday, and I think it will take some years um, for us to really, really grasp the nature of the change that's going on nowadays. But there seems to be actually a shift um, so yeah, internationalization will also have to adapt probably to, to, to uh, you know, any kind of hybrid ways or uh, I don't see it happening entirely online. I think a lot of students also want a different kind of international experience, um, of course, but um, yeah, I think this is a moment where we're just kind of rearranging um, a bit and I think in a year or two or, or so we'll be able to understand exactly what's uh, going on right now. That's just my take. So I don't know if anyone has, has a point on this, happy to hear it. Thank you, Silvio. Would anyone else comment on this or anything else that you've heard on this round table? Yeah, so I, I think that's also something for us to learn, you know, who design these courses because it, it does facilitate the exchange between the students from different backgrounds and places and uh, makes it a lot more easy but it also comes with a different type of experience um so um and at the moment i feel like i'm experimenting with like how to design those 
courses that are hybrid or like online, right? And, um, and possibly we could also start systematizing the, the lessons there for how, how this can then be learned or the role of uh, digital tools in international student teaching environment. If I can uh, follow up uh, uh, on that comment, that's exactly what we discussed yesterday in the panel, because now there's also starting to, to we started to gather data. I mean, we um, researchers from, from uh, around the, the world um, on, uh, you know, student learning, the effects of, of this whole move online. Um, and I think it'd be very interesting to also see how international internationalization in times of COVID has an impact on, you know, on student learning, on, on teaching staff and on the institutions uh, themselves. And, and one of the challenges there, I think, is how to you know, facilitate exchange, interactive exchange. <laughs> I think what's, that's also what we're partly facing now. Um, like with the platforms, right? Um, uh, how, how these things. Mm -hmm. And we have a question from Alistair Jones. He's asking how well go international students integrate with home students? Is there support or help for them? And I know from literature, that this is the issue in, in particular in the British higher education. So maybe I can ask each from the presenters to share their experience. I start with Tamara. Oh, you already said that Bart was a highly internationalized institution. My experience is perhaps not reflective because Bart is designed to be an international institution. It's an American university that sits in the middle of Berlin. And mm -hmm. so who would be a, a domestic student in, in this context and who would be an international um, is quite a big question. And uh, But um, my experience was that I... I genuinely didn't notice much difference between my, my um, American students who could be called domestic and my German students who were very few actually, and the rest of the students except in one sense, which is that Bard is a liberal arts university and it really teaches Western scholarship. And there is actually, I'm no longer at Bard, I'm, I'm currently moving to a different university, but uh, while I was at Bard and while I was leaving Bard, uh, we had ongoing discussions about what does it mean to de-westernize the curriculum and uh, what does this mean for uh, who is domestic and who is international and whose scholarship we are, we are um, teaching or learning. So in a way, I think Bard is only now opening these questions because while it is really a, an international university and, and uh, I've had courses in which American students were a deep minority. Um, I think in, in, in the way that the education is set up, it is primarily an American university. So it has, it grapples with the same issues that I guess everyone else will grapple with just in a bit of a different way. It doesn't grapple with the language problems. It's naturally in English, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a question for Bart as well, I think. Would any other from the panelists like to answer the question too? Well, I can I can follow up a, a little bit also on the COVID stuff. Um, uh, in my experience, I, I I was teaching throughout the first lockdown, and I also had some Erasmus students. And I I really think that uh, if if online teaching is to go on, it will it will necessitate some changes to the Erasmus program because um, I think the, this time the visiting students had a very very different experience. Uh, I mean, of course, the conditions during the first lockdown were a little bit extreme. So they were basically locked down <laughs> at the dorms and they weren't able to leave when they wanted. Uh, but because they came only for a semester, they, I don't think they were able to make any meaningful contacts with their, with their colleagues, with their students, uh, because most of the group already knew each other from the first semester. I was teaching in, in, in the summer semester. And um, and suddenly these visiting students came and they only saw their colleagues in online sessions, which I don't think is enough for for to you know to, to make any sort of meaningful context. So mm -hmm. if online teaching is to continue, maybe we should maybe universities should think about setting up some sort of channels uh, which would be online where students can um, talk to each other or meet each other outside class, like like not necessarily. Uh, um, so that they don't meet only during classes when they when they sit in lectures, but mm -hmm. they should they should have an online space where they can meet just mm -hmm. to chat or you know exchange experiences, etc. Basically, to socialize that 
certainly some well thought strategies are needed uh, not to leave it on the students themselves. Markita raised her hand. Yeah, I just wanted to add that we really need to focus on informal curriculum in the program. So otherwise they will stay separate in international groups and these informal activities such as discussions, sports activities, uh, they can really help to mix these groups. So it's uh, the, on the same level, like the for, formal curriculum, the informal activities need to be uh, discussed and needs to be incorporated in the study program itself. We don't have a question from Hanna. What can be learned from the teaching of international students concerning native students? And then Leslie raised his hand or her hand. So does anyone want to answer the question, what can we learn from uh, teaching international students for uh, teaching home students? Well, sorry, maybe I put native in, in the brackets <laughs> because I, what I mean is the national students that we have, I think mm -hmm. that wasn't it um, Maketa that addressed that you started out with uh, national students only? So, but but I also think all this experience you got, isn't there anything that is useful for all the other courses that we teach? That just doesn't. It's not only for the international students because there's a lot of things you have been talking about that are sort of things of all this is about active learning. It's letting the students create knowledge that they apply to something. All these things are some of the aspects that you address. But but is there anything that can inspire the other way around, so to speak? Yeah, I would add that. Uh like teaching, have experience with international students helps me to be more creative, to open more perspectives. And it definitely shaped the way how I'm teaching just in the local setting and or our uh, local students. So I think that there is no way back. It's uh, really inspiring, but I would say the most uh, beneficial is the dealing with diversity, with diverse sources, diverse stories, uh, perspectives, um, sources, literature, articles, because it, education, it's sometimes really, really nationalized. So the global perspectives is definitely uh, beneficial for me as a teacher. And I would like to conclude with the last question that was posed by Leslie Adler. What support is given or provided for international students with disabilities? Which is certainly a highly relevant question. So would you like to anyone elaborate on their institutional experience? Silvio? Yeah, no, I also actually, that's why I put my hand up because I wanted to get back to that. I think it's a very, very good question. Um, I also, I'm not sure whether you mean learning disabilities or physical disabilities, but I think you know, both are, are equally relevant. Um, I think this differs very much from institution to institution. I think my assumption is that not much is going on. Um, also, especially on the learning disability part, uh, a lot of, uh, of students with learning disabilities have been forced into online learning. And it's for a fact that it doesn't work for them. So. Um, definitely something that uh, should be uh, better developed in, in the future. Um, if you look, just as an example, if you look at the Erasmus program, uh, it starts to put a lot of digital components into it that, you know, uh, really, really aims at getting teachers to, to develop more digital content, but they overlook the student learning part. Um, and I think every time we design a learn a digital learning course or anything, we also have to ask the students, you know, what, how does this work on you? Just because we think it's going to work doesn't mean it's going to work. I think it's a very, very, very complicated um, situation, but we'll have to, all the part with student well-being has to, and it's becoming more and more important. And I think it will dominate in the next uh, year as well. Thank you very much, Silvio. Now I would like to... I'll conclude with um, three sentences, perhaps. So I would like to thank everyone to come and join us for this roundtable educating for a change, and especially for joining us in the Kahoot game. This roundtable has been organized uh, by 
uh, or has been co-sponsored by the teaching and learning politics standing group of the ECPR and I would like to invite you to join the standing group. Also, I would like to warmly invite you to attend two more panels that our standing group is convening during this conference. Uh, one is uh, in the afternoon walking clinic when you can get useful advice and share your teaching difficulties. Uh, and you can easily remember the numbers of uh, the panels, which is exactly 200, panel number 200 and panel number 202. So it's this afternoon uh, and tomorrow afternoon. Uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, the European Commission for uh, providing us uh, with a grant to implement the project impact. So thanks everyone and goodbye.